Father, thank you for this evening. We are so thankful, Lord, for every person that's able to be here tonight. And I would pray, Lord, for healing for Frank and, uh, Lord, for any others that are still trying to make their way here. I pray you bring them in safely. And we invite your spirit to give us understanding of your word as we read through it tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we covered... Uh, chapter 38 and 39, and then we talked about Judah and Tamar, um, which was his daughter-in-law. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to, because it would take way too much time, and it's uh, kind of an uncomfortable subject to rush through. So <laughs> we talked through it in detail. Uh, but out of Judah uh, lying with Tamar, uh, unbeknowing, that it was his daughter-in-law and all that um, comes out uh, a set of twins and we talked about how Perez and Zira are the twins and Perez is uh, a part of the lineage of King David and of Jesus so whenever you go to Matthew 1 you can read the lineage of Christ and you'll see Perez listed in there um, and this is that Perez so we just we just tied that together then we went into chapter 39, and we talked about, uh, so, so what you, what I pointed out last week was chapter 37 was talking about Joseph and how he was sold by his brothers to some Midianites, and he was taken off to Egypt, and uh, he was sold to Potiphar, uh, one of Pharaoh's officers and the captain of the bodyguard. That's the end of chapter 37. Chapter 38 is this whole story about Judah. That's one of uh, Joseph's older brothers and what he does with this woman, Tamar. And the reason the scripture includes that, I'm certain, is because Perez comes out of it. And out of the line of Judah and Perez, you eventually have King David and all the way down to Jesus, the Messiah. So then, uh, so 38 is like sandwiched uh, right in the middle of the story of Joseph. And that Joseph being sold. And then in chapter 39, we pick back up with Joseph and uh, how he goes into Egypt, how uh, he, uh, because of the blessing that's upon him, he causes Potiphar's house to be blessed. Everything he touches is blessed and Potiphar puts him in charge of everything. And uh, if it wasn't for Potiphar's wife uh, uh, lying and uh, actually desiring Joseph uh, and wanting him to sleep with her multiple times and he kept saying no so then she tricked him and when he ran out of the house and left his robe uh, she lied to Potiphar about him said that he had taken advantage of her so we wrapped up last week chapter 39 wrapped it up with Joseph being imprisoned so um, okay so I'm sure she's okay okay just want to make sure that I've been, I've been there when she was. Well, I, as long as I hear her coughing, I know she's okay. When she when she got quiet, that's when I was looking over there to make sure. So. All right, so uh, that's how we wrapped up last week. Joseph is imprisoned, falsely accused of. Uh, Miss Susan, did you need something from her? Oh, I was going to tell you that um, one of the guys had something. Okay. Uh, he had the. A battery powered with a charger and I'm able to get he just couldn't give up the battery but, but I found batteries online all right reasonable so we're good very good well thank you all right we're trying to find the weed eater to help a family in the church and we found one <laughs> okay so we're gonna uh, we're gonna begin tonight in chapter 40 Then it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them and he took care of them, and they were, con they were in confinement for some time. Then the cupbearer 
and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night, each man with his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them. Behold, they were dejected. He asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? Then they said to him, We have had a dream, and there is no one to interpret it. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. Amen. So, while Joseph is in prison, uh, a couple of the king's officials get put in. It says a cupbearer and chief baker. And Joseph, again, has been put in charge of everything. Uh, just like with Potiphar. So here he is a slave, but because of God's favor and anointing on him, anything he's put in charge of prospers and does really well. And so Potiphar, we remember a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, Potiphar, it said, did not charge him. He, he didn't worry about anything except the food he put in his mouth. <laughs> he literally didn't have to worry about anything. Joseph ran everything for him. Well, whenever Potiphar got rid of him and put him in prison, the jailer finds out, hey, wait a minute, this guy, there's something about him. And it doesn't take long before Joseph is promoted up again to a place where he's running things, right? He's still a slave, still a servant. He's an imprisoned slave. It's gotten worse, but God is still working in his life. And that's something we covered a lot last week was that we need to remember that no matter what God allows in our life, no matter what hardships may come, what trials we may go through, it doesn't separate us from God and His plan for us, the way He is working in our lives. Thank you. So um, that's a really, really cool thing uh, that this looks like a terrible situation for Joseph. And I'm not about to say that it wasn't hard. He's in prison. And one, one of the words in the chapter even calls it a dungeon. So um, it's, it's not a good place. Joseph wants out. We'll see that as we read. But God is using the very difficult situation. God is using him being lied about, falsely accused. God's using it. God is working in the midst of uh, wrong treatment abuse. He did the same thing when his brothers sold him into the Midianites. He used the bad situation Joseph was in to work it to good. There's a New Testament verse that says God works all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And that means that whatever stumbles, falls, mistakes, trials, health problems, whatever has gone on in your life, you had a, a, a bad mom, dad, a bad childhood experience, whatever it is, God can take it and he can work it to good in our lives. You know? Yeah. Uh, so a, a lot of us have us points in our life that maybe didn't go so well or struggles. Uh, maybe it was something happened in our school days, but God can use it and he does use it. And that's what we see in Joseph. He's a great example of this because when he was sold as a slave to Potiphar, he was faithful, faithful to the Lord. He continued to believe God and hold on to God through it all. And last, or two weeks ago, no, no, last week, we talked about how wouldn't it have been easy for Joseph to just shake his fist at God and curse him for letting him be sold. And we talked about how Joseph had had these dreams where God gave him these dreams that he would rule over his mother, father, brothers, and sisters. And, um, and it could have been, he could have very easily felt like God misled him or uh, that God isn't there for him anymore. He, he could have, but he did not. He holds on to God. And it's going to reward him because he's learning something in Potiphar's house, running all the, the things that Potter has, Potiphar has in a possession. And now as he's put into the jail, he now is overseeing all these prisoners. God's preparing him to be a ruler. He's preparing him to be a leader. He's preparing him to be able to organize and, and 
uh, and control things with good leadership. Joseph has no idea where he's going. He has no idea what's coming. Most of us in the room, how many of you know where Joseph is headed? His position. You, we all know where what he's going to, right? He will be second to Pharaoh, right? He has no idea what's coming. No idea. In fact, if, if, if somebody said your wildest dream, what would you think? He would no way guess as a Hebrew slave who's in prison that he would sit and have the power greater than any Egyptian, only second to Pharaoh. He has no idea at this point what's coming, but he's holding on to God. And that's what we've got to do. No matter what comes our way, no matter what trials and storms, and we can be falsely accused, lied about, all kinds of things can happen to us. And it could make us bitter. It could make us question God. It could make us do a lot of things. But Joseph is a great example to follow in this. Hold on to God. He's working in you. He's working and he's going to use it to good at some point. So let's go back to our passage in chapter 40. And actually get into our story again here. So Joseph is put in charge of them. And he's taking care of these two guys. Who are uh, prisoners like himself. And they both have a dream on the same night. They're separate dreams. They have their own interpretations. But they get them on the same night. And the next morning when Joseph finds them. They're all distraught. And so as the passage says. He asks them what's going on. Why are you all distraught. And and uh, while your face is down, and uh, they, they say, we had a dream, but there's nobody to interpret it. This must be pretty significant dreams because we all have dreams, right? But we don't wake up in the morning distraught because there's not an interpreter every day, right? <laughs> so when they had such a dream, it was so strong that they felt this dream is different. Something is different, and we, we wish someone would interpret it. Here's where we get a glimpse at where Joseph is with God, right? We get little glimpses, like whenever he was talking to Potiphar's wife, and she was trying to get him to sleep with her, and she says, you know what? My master has not withheld anything from me except you. Should I sin against God and my master? We knew then he had a fear of God, right? Here, we see a faith in God. Listen to what verse 8 says again. He said to them, we, they said, we had a dream and there is no one to interpret. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. What's he doing? He's, and, he, and he's about to say, tell it to me, please. Tell me the dream. Why would he do that? If God's the only one that can interpret, why would he ask them to tell him? Except that he believes that God may very well interpret it. And he believes he's connected to the God who interprets dreams. Or why would he ask, right? So he's asking because he has faith in God. He has a relationship with God at a level that he's ready to at least say, I'll hear it out and ask God what he thinks. That's a relationship. So Joseph, in spite of everything that's going on with him, he has a relationship with God. He believes that God is a personal God who will interact and actually answer his prayer. There's no reason for Joseph to ask for the, what the dream was if he wasn't going to ask God, who he just said is the only one that can interpret. It's very easy to put that puzzle piece together. All right, let's go to verse 9. So the chief cupbearer told his dream, <coughs> his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. And as it was budding, its blossoms came out, and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office and you will 
put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to uh, your former custom uh, when you were his cupbearer. Now, what I find interesting about this is that the minute he tells the dream, Joseph knows the interpretation. He knows immediately. If we look back on Joseph's life, remember that Joseph himself has had some pretty significant dreams. The sun and the moon are going to bow down and all the stars are going to bow down. There's these sheaves that are going to bow down to his sheaf. Remember those dreams? Yeah. Read them before I went on sabbatical. We read those dreams. <laughs> it's been a while back. So we don't actually get in the story at that point that Joseph knew exactly what all that meant or how that was going to play out. But we know that his father, Jacob or Israel, we know Jacob said, will, will your brothers and your father and mother really bow down to you? So we know that Jacob understood what those images meant. He interpreted the dream. So Joseph is not a stranger to God giving the dream and the interpretation, even whether it was Joseph who received it or it was his father. He knows this happens. He's familiar with this, and he very well may have understood it, though I really do not believe he knew he was going to be in Egypt and all those things. But uh, I think somehow God was saying, you're going to be over your brother's and your mom and your dad and uh, he just had no idea what it really looked like you know sometimes when we look at what God says in the New Testament God's promises God's word how he's going to grow us in the likeness of Christ how how we're going to serve him callings on our life we don't always know when God calls when he speaks something to us even when we read a promise we don't always know exactly how that's going to look I remember when God called me into the ministry, I was uh, between my junior and senior year in high school. Uh, my plan was to be an architect. I was, you know, whether I would have made it through the math, I don't know, but that was my plan, right? I was gonna try. And so um, I, I was at Youth Camp in Gloria, New Mexico, and very clearly heard God ask me, would I give my life to him to serve him in ministry? I said, yes, absolutely. I knew that it just was a, an, an automatic, no thinking about it. But I had no idea what that was gonna look like. I didn't know if I was gonna be a missionary. I didn't know if I was gonna be an evangelist. I didn't know if I was gonna be in youth ministry the rest of my life. Uh, I, pastor was like the least thing I thought of. I wanted something with a little more glamor. And, <laughs> Is that, really, thank you. So God, God slowly, after I became a youth minister in college, I was a youth minister for two years while I was finishing up my bachelor's, and it was during that time. And I did that because I got a call of ministry. I love to teach the Bible. There's a job opening in my church. I'm going to see if I can get it. It's nice to have some extra pay besides being a painter for the physical plant. And I got it. And what I still did not know was that two years of being a youth minister over about 40 to 50 kids gave me, let me see that I had a shepherd's heart. That all of a sudden I, my grandiose vision of preaching to thousands of youth as an evangelist, you know. I loved Dawson McAllister back in the 80s, and I loved going to youth conferences and seeing him bring the word, and I knew how much it hit me, and I wanted to do that. But after being a youth minister for two years, God really showed me what it was like to care for a little flock and watch them grow. And it wasn't until then that I began to feel like, you know what, I may be, I may be called to be a pastor. And um, it turns out that's what the Lord had in mind. But the only reason I tell that story is because God speaks words to all of us. It's not always a call to ministry, but he speaks promises to us in his word, all through his word. But just because he's promised it doesn't mean you'll have it that day, maybe not even in the next year. 
but we keep holding on to God. He's going to make us conform us into the likeness of His Son. He's uh, He's growing us. He's maturing us. He's sanctifying us. How many of you know that the day you got born again, you were justified, but the sanctification work of you becoming more and more holy is a process of growing in faith, growing in truth. There's a lot of there's time involved. You, know, you none of us knows what we're going to look like and when and what the. But we hold on to God. We hold on to His promises through trials, which God, by the way, is using to sanctify us and grow us, and mature us. You can't become mature in Christ without going through trials of many kinds, according to James 1 and according to 1 Peter. So you and I don't know. We, we want and we pray for God to grow us up in Christ. But if we read carefully the scriptures, that means going through trials of many kinds. We may still say, I even knowing that, Father, I want to grow in Christ. I want to grow in maturity in Christ. And if he says yes, which he does because it's a promise and every promise is yes and amen from the Lord, then we still have no idea what trials. We don't. They're going to come as God ordains them in his time. And we're going to walk through them holding on tight to him. And that's to go back to Joseph. Joseph does that. He has this relationship. He's being used by God in difficult situations. He's holding on to God and his interpretation skills partly are coming out of the past and coming out of an ongoing current relationship with God, even in the storm. And you'll never find a better way to go through a storm than with God. You never want to go through one without him. So, all right. Can I ask a question? Yes. I know you, you had to go through a lot of trials. Was there ever a time when you thought, Listen, uh, I can't do this. I don't want to do this anymore. I have, uh, I've told God he could have the church I was at <laughs> twice. <laughs> <laughs> this was in my Rock Hill days before was the merger. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> this was uh, two weeks ago. No, <laughs> no. I, yeah, it was, it was tough when I first read to Rock Hill small group of old people who had run it for a long time. They ran off a preacher about every two years on average over the last 50 years. Um, nobody had a tenure more than three in all that time. And that's what I went into as a 24 year old. So I was praying a lot. And uh, anyways, I won't go into all of what I preached and taught them because yeah, I, I don't want to <laughs> but when, yes, I had a few periods where uh, it got so so heavy and um, and the attacks were pretty fierce and it was a, when the when the group got larger and things like that that um, I on two occasions told Heather whenever God opens the next door we're gone <laughs> and I and I told the Lord I'm done with these people but as I kept waiting God softened my heart and I forgave and I've done funerals for every single one of them. So Joseph's story really means something to you, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, I probably talk about it with a little bit of passion because mm -hmm. I know this is how it goes. It's just, but I wouldn't have gotten the blessings I have if I had ran. I know that. I would have missed out on God merging two churches. I would have missed out on all kinds of things in my life. If I had run after two years, I would have missed a multitude of blessings that I've gotten from staying. And so, yeah, I've, I've learned, but it was the grace of God that I was able to stay. Because, um, But as far as leaving ministry, Nicole, I've never had any peace about that at all. I just was ready to go to a new field. <laughs> I wanted some I want some sheep that don't bite. <laughs> That's I mean. But God said all sheep bite, so stay there. Yeah. You're already getting used to them. So <laughs> and I loved everyone. I gotta tell you that. We went through those rough times and it may sound like it was but we got through it and I loved them. They loved me. And that's what I mean when I when I Buried each one. I didn't take them out and shoot them and bury them. I, I, I loved them and pastored them up to the time they died and uh, was honored to do their funerals. But, you know, there's just bumps along the way. And so.
with uh, everything in life. Like with everything in life, yes. Any job you've got, there's going to be bumpy times. So, All right. So uh, we just read, and I know I, I got to not chase rabbits and tell stories. Um, so Joseph interprets the cupbearer's dream, and he says in three days, you know, you're going to be restored. And in verse 14, Joseph so is so confident that this is faith, right? He is so confident that what he just interpreted, God spoke something. That's the only way you have this kind of faith. It's the only way you have this kind of confidence. He knows that God just gave him the interpretation of that man's dream. And he says, hey, within three days, you're going to be back. Uh, that's cupbearer. When you get there, what? When you get there, that means he believes it. He knows. When you get there, don't, don't forget me. He says, only keep, in, keep me in mind when it goes well with you. When what I've said, when what God has said, goes well with you please do me a kindness by mentioning me to pharaoh and get me out of this house this house arrest this dungeon i'm in for i was in fact kidnapped from the land of the hebrews and even here i have done nothing uh, that they should have put me into the dungeon nothing that they should have put me into the dungeon I'm innocent, but I'm here, and I'm, I'm hoping to get out, right? Um, verse 16 says, When the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, that is, for the cupbearer, right? He says, Oh, I like this. This sounds good. He said to Joseph, I also saw in my dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. And in the top basket, there were some of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, notice he doesn't go away and pray overnight. He immediately knows what the interpretation is. That's the spirit of God upon him. This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree and the birds will eat your flesh off. Wow. He didn't mix words. Yeah. No, no. He says it exactly the way the Lord is giving it to him. It's pretty, pretty harsh. Um, but the dream was given by the Lord. The interpretation comes from the Lord. And uh, if Joseph had made up a lie it would not have changed the outcome for this man what is going to happen is what is going to happen and joseph is just giving him the interpretation from god um verse 20 says thus it came about on the third day which was pharaoh's birthday that he made a feast for all his servants and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants he restored the chief cupbearer to his office and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker. This is Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So we don't really get exactly how many more years. But chapter 41, verse 1 lets us know that years went by. Now it happened at the end of two full years, the Pharaoh, what well, did I say two full? There's another place that I was thinking we didn't get the number. Um, it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. Behold, he was standing by the Nile, and lo, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows, then Pharaoh awoke. All right, so I'm gonna just check on your memory here. How many of you know what the seven pretty cows are, what the seven ugly cows are, before we read the rest of it? Years. 
grain and everything was great. Yes. Everything was much, much produced in the land. Seven years of blessing. Blessing, yep. just yep. pure blessing, above and beyond. But then in the next seven years, nothing. Yep. Drought. Extreme nothing. drought, famine. Yep. Yep. And you get, you got the, uh, Got this picture of cows, sleek and fat and ugly and gaunt. And <laughs> that kind of makes sense when you think about how blessed, if, if you're just overflowing with food and, and then when you have nothing, right? So the Pharaoh wakes up and then he fell asleep again. And he dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump, and good sounds familiar then behold seven ears thin and scorched by the east wind sprouted up after them that also sounds familiar you've got a year you've got uh, this, everything plump and fat and good and, and prosperous and then you have thin and uh, scorched uh, which would speak to the drought years uh, the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ear ears then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now in the morning his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So again, just like with the cupbearer and the chief baker, um, this is no ordinary dream. These two dreams that he has back to back, they're no ordinary dreams. There's something about them that causes him to be distraught, uh, troubled in his spirit whenever he wakes up. It's not like other dreams. It's, it's pretty big. Um, I, I think that's something that we could use as a guide if, if we're wondering, did God give me a dream or not? Uh, is, am I supposed to interpret this or not? Um, God still does this, by the way. Um, I, I would use this as a guide to say, well, if I had a dream that was so, uh, that I couldn't shake it, um, then I would be asking God, is this from you? <laughs> do you have something you want to communicate to me? If you do, then send me an interpreter or help me to know what you're saying to me. God would never give a dream without giving the interpretation. That would not make any sense. But sometimes we may have to search that out like Pharaoh did. He called on many people. No one could interpret it. None of his wise men, none of his magicians, everybody that should be able to do these type of things, none of them can interpret his dreams. And uh, so it says he's very, very frustrated. But then the chief cupbearer remembers somebody. It said then the chief cupbearer, verse 9, spoke to Pharaoh saying, I would make mention today... Uh, of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, a Hebrew youth was with us. There, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related them to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream, and just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he hanged him. So, this is jogged the cupbearer's memory, and he's letting Pharaoh or one of those officials very close to Pharaoh know this, and so the Pharaoh uh, is about to send for Joseph. Um, he's desperate. He's troubled. He's had dreams that he believes mean something to him, and uh, he wants to know what it is. He's hungry to know. Can y'all think of any other famous uh, king who had some Pretty big dreams. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, 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 Nebuchadnezzar Babylonian king. Yeah. yeah. 
had two different dreams at two different times, and Daniel was the man who would interpret those, right? And Daniel had the same words that Joseph does. God is the one who interprets dreams. Because Nebuchadnezzar would say, you're amazing, Joseph. You, uh, Daniel, you, you can interpret dreams, and he would say, God is the only one who interprets dreams. So this is flowing. Uh, rather, I'm sorry, Joseph comes before uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So uh, actually Daniel will learn from Joseph and his experience. I'm reading in two different places in my Bible right now. <laughs> so, um, all right, let's get back. Yes, yes, yes. You have a question or anything? Okay. Does anybody have a question or comment before we? Okay. All right. So verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Which shows the expedience of that gift that Joseph has as well, that when you hear it, you can interpret it, that it doesn't seem to be something he has to think about for a few weeks. Joseph then answered Pharaoh saying, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So Daniel, a few hundred years from now, will uh, have read this, believe me. Daniel was a studier of the scriptures, and this is the Pentateuch. Pentateuch is around, the first five books of the around, the law is around for Daniel. He studies this, he knows this. So um, when he sees that God is using him to interpret, it's, it's amazing how similar his language is to Joseph. And I believe he pulls it right from scripture. So Joseph says, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. There's even faith there. He's saying God will give you your interpretation. He just knows it. Um, I think we can liken that to when Jesus knows this man is to take up his mat and walk. But not everybody Jesus encountered got healed. Um, when he was at the pool of Siloam, there were people all around the pool wanting to be healed. He healed one beggar who couldn't get himself down to the pool. So he doesn't. There, there are examples. In fact, the gate beautiful, the beggar there that Peter and uh, John will say, Silver or gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus, take up your mat and walk. The passage says that beggar had been there for many, many years. The gate beautiful, Jesus would have passed through many times going in and out of the temple. He didn't heal that man. That man was held for Peter and John later. Um, so I say that because <clears throat> when you're walking with the Lord like this, um, and the Spirit of God quickens your heart, speaks to your heart. You can speak very confidently like you see Joseph doing, like Jesus, like Peter and Paul and others. They take up your map. They, they would speak words with great confidence and authority. And I believe it's because the Spirit of God first spoke in their heart. We don't, we don't make things happen. We hear what the Father wants to do and we say what we hear Him saying and that's when God is doing what God wants to do. Um, sometimes in Christian, uh, some circles of Christianity, the teachings go on that uh, we have this power to force God to do what we want by faith. That is not even scriptural. When you look at the Bible, faith is not me believing something so much that I can make God do what I want him to do. Faith is hearing the word of God. What does the Bible say? Faith cometh by hearing the word. When God speaks to our heart, faith rises up in us. When God speaks to us through his written word, faith comes inside of us. And it's that faith that gives us confidence to declare and speak things because we've heard God speak something clearly to us. Not even reading the Bible and believing the truth is that it's not the same as when the Spirit speaks. There's, there's some words for that. A rhema word versus a logos word. 
This is the Logos word, the written. A rhema word is when the Spirit of God speaks something directly to us. And when we hear that spoken thing, that's when that authority, that boldness rises up. Um, it's very different. There's a confidence when you hear God speak something of assurance inside of you. And we serve the living God. His Spirit lives inside of us. Why shouldn't we hear Him speak to us on occasion about things that He wants us to do or to say? So when Joseph is there before Pharaoh, uh, he says, look, God is the only one that can interpret a dream, but he will give you a favorable answer. He's going to do this. I believe the Lord showed him that, spoke that to him. And so uh, we go on and it says uh, in verse 17, so Pharaoh spoke to Joseph in my dream. Behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile and behold, seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the Nile, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Lo, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such as I had never seen for ugliness in all the land of Egypt. And the lean and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. Yet when they had devoured them, it could not be detected that they had devoured them. So the gaunt, ugly cow didn't become fat after it ate the fat cow. That's what he's saying. And he's saying it doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, if you've ever watched a snake eat a frog, he's got a frog shape inside of him when he goes down, right? So, <laughs> and he's saying the gaunt cows were really thin. They ate fat cows, but they didn't get fat. Right? So he says, um, uh, yet when they had devoured them, it could not be detected that they had devoured them, for they were just as ugly as before. Then I awoke. I saw also in my dream, and behold, seven ears, full and good, came up on a single stalk, and lo, seven ears withered thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And the thin ears swallowed the seven good ears. Then I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. So he's, he's now saying, so here's what I dreamed. Here's my two dreams I had back to back. I told it to the magicians and none of them could explain what this meant. Verse 25, now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. Now this is really good. God has told to Pharaoh what he is about to do. That too sounds exactly like what God will do with Nebuchadnezzar a few hundred years later. God is going to show Nebuchadnezzar what he's going to do in the future and in the uh, near future and in the far distant future. God it's going to show you. He has told Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. And the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one and the same. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven thin ears scorched by the east wind will be seven years of famine. It is as... I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will come and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine will ravage the land. So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine for it will be very severe. Now, as for the repeating of the dream, why would God tell two that mean the same thing? It's very interesting. It means that the matter is determined by God. There's not going to be a change to this. And you see, I see whenever I read things like this, and I, and I, you know, I hear the uh, voice in the background of popular atheists that are writing their books that are bestsellers these days, and they're all full of hate on God and God's a hateful God. He just wants to wipe people out, destroy people. He's just mean, 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 mean. They don't read things like this. 
This is God who knows seven years of very severe famine are coming. And he knows seven years before that a blessing are coming. Does the God of all creation owe it to Pharaoh or anybody else for that matter to let them know what's coming? He does not. That is the goodness of God. That is the grace and mercy of God. Pharaoh is not a righteous leader. He's a pagan. He worships pagan gods that are demons. He doesn't even know the God who's giving him these dreams. But God does not just help the Hebrew people. He doesn't just help people that are his own people. God loves people. He cares about life. And so in order to save many lives, he sends this dream to probably the most powerful person on the planet, without doubt, in that region. But because the world was a small place at this time, Pharaoh is probably the most powerful figure on the entire planet. He is a, a, a tremendously powerful figure. And God goes to him. And it's, it's amazing. This famine, as we would, you know, we'll see as we read through four, later chapters, it's going to affect far more than the land of Egypt. It's going to affect lands all the way out for hundreds and hundreds of miles around Egypt. And that's why it's so important that, uh, that God is giving this to Pharaoh as knowledge. Because Pharaoh has the ability to, he has the wealth to be able to uh, store up. Whereas if you went to one of the smaller kings in the land of Canaan, they could not have done what Pharaoh could do. God is working through a person, a vehicle, a vessel to be able to save thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. Egyptian, Hebrew, Canaanite, didn't matter. He knows what's coming. Now, I know we could all ask the question, well, couldn't God have just said, we're not going to have seven years of famine? He could. But God allows things to unfold. He allows the earth to run the way it runs. And I think even if God said, I'm going to make seven years of famine, even if that's how it happened, he did it for his glory. He is, we're still talking about him. And, and he's going to show Pharaoh that there is a God who can interpret dreams when none of his gods in Egypt could. This is a witness. We see the same thing when Daniel interprets for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar will literally reject all other gods on the planet and will say there is only one God. It's the God of Daniel. And if you declare anything else, I'll kill you. Basically, that's what Nebuchadnezzar says. It takes a while for Nebuchadnezzar to be converted, but he gets converted. I'm telling you, I have studied Nebuchadnezzar. I, I did a lot of teaching on him and a lot of studying on him a few years ago. And if you were in church back then, you remember me. I preached a lot about him. I, have, I will be absolutely shocked if Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is not in heaven because of the way God pursued him <laughs> using Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace and Daniel and interpreting of dreams and all these things to get this one probably chubby king who worshiped <laughs> pagan gods to believe in him. I'm just blown away. Yeah, but what do you think it did to him when Daniel was put in the lion's den? Well, by then, Nebuchadnezzar was dead. Was he dead? Yes, by then, it was a Persian king. Darius. But it, it, yeah, Darius. And Darius was grieved greatly and did not want him in that den. And it says Darius fasted and prayed for Daniel, and he was so excited when Daniel survived. And then he killed the people who had Daniel put in there. <laughs> but we're getting way ahead and out of Genesis here. <laughs> but I, I like to tie these things together because... It's, it's amazing to see how God will pursue the, the Ninevites. The lost. The Ninevites. The lost people. People. The Ninevites were the terrorist nation of their day. Yeah. And God called Jonah, who did not yes. want to go, and said, no, go. Why? Because he loves the wicked people of Nineveh and he wants to repay, he wants to save their life. You, all through the Old Testament, the goodness of God, the love and the mercy of God, and not just for one people group. He's inviting many to repent. 
and and so you know we'll get we'll get back to Pharaoh now. So I'm <laughs> taking you all over the place, but I, I get really excited when I see these places where the love of God is right there, the goodness of God. I don't have to just read a psalm where it says God is good. I can see it in the narratives of Scripture. We serve a good God. Amen. We serve a good God. He's a loving, merciful God. Does He have a wrathful side? Is He a judge? Yes, He does. And we should fear Him. Absolutely. But He is a good God. He is love itself. And we see it here the way that He uses Joseph. And he's, he's, it's a witness to Pharaoh. It's a witness to anybody that knows who Joseph worships and serves. And again... Uh, because of the way God works, he can cause the power and authority of a kingdom to be handed to one of his servants. Um, again, to, to, to not beat this to death, but Daniel will be given tremendous political power under Nebuchadnezzar. He will be second under Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian Empire, which at that time, when that comes about, is the greatest empire on earth. And even God says that. When he says the head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar. It's the most powerful, the richest kingdom. And who's second in command? Daniel. Daniel. Who's second in command or will be in a little bit? Joseph. Joseph, Joseph. right? Yeah. These are servants of God. Both of them are slaves. Yeah. Both of them have no position, no authority. It's amazing the similarities between these two stories and what God will do through them. Really, really amazing. Okay, let me try to finish this chapter. I chase rabbits. Bam, I chase rabbits. Nowhere to finish this chapter. Where is chapter 42? Yeah. There it is. I, well, I don't think we're going to finish this chapter. Let's go as far as we can here, and then we'll, we might get through. Good grief, it's hot in here. I'm burning up. Are you cold? No. Oh, I'm like, are you? I'm like, Get a ceiling. It's been ten minutes. It's been well, no, I, I want it to be clear, buddy. Ten minutes. All right. So, uh, got through that. Got through that. Okay. So, verse thirty-two. Now, as for the re repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God, and God will quickly bring it about. Now, let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise. And set him over the land of Egypt. He's even giving him wise counsel. Find a wise man and set him over Egypt. This is from God. God is saying to you, Pharaoh, you should find a wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land. And let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. You see this. God doesn't just say, hey, there's going to be seven years of famine, and before that, seven years of abundant blessing. Good luck. God says, here's exactly what you need to do. Here's exactly. It means giving mathematical equations here. He's, he's saying, oh, you need to take a fifth. Let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years. It's a tax. Start slowing up. He doesn't say guess at it. He tells him exactly how much. And he says, uh, then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Let the food become a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land will not perish during the famine. Now, the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his servants. Again. You know, I just kind of went off on my little preaching thing on how good God is. That's that's just that much more evidence of how good he is that he would give even the details of exactly how to carry this thing out. All right. So verse 38. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this? He's pointing at Joseph. Can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? It's a spirit from God, right? A, a God spirit. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, 
There is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Just like with Potiphar, just like with the jailer. He is right under the top guy. And he's in charge of everything. Was God preparing him for this day? Yes. He absolutely was preparing him for this day. He was showing him, if you'll honor, you'll do what I'm telling you. I can elevate you no matter where you are. Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and he put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace around his neck. Wow. Think about this. Is this a picture of what happens to us when we're born again? Amen. Right? Yep. We, we, we're a slave. Yep. We're in chains. We're in bondage. Y'all, just because they shaved him and put clean clothes on him and brought him before Pharaoh did not mean that he was not still a prisoner and a Hebrew slave. Nothing changed in his position because he's standing there interpreting a dream. He could have interpreted the dream and been sent right back to prison and said, thank you, Joseph. That is not what happens. The ring comes off and goes on his hand. He's, he's put all these fine robes come upon him. I mean, think about us. When we approach Christ, we're sinners, we're dirty, we're filthy, we're enslaved to sin, in bondage. We've got all this junk on our lives. And in a snap of a finger, when we put our faith in him, we become his sons and daughters. Our position changes immediately. Immediately. And we're given great authority to rule and to lead according to scripture. And we will in the last days. So he... Every time I do this, I lose my place. Excuse me. Just like that. Um, Here's on verse 42. Thank you. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring and from his hand and he put it on Joseph's hand and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee. Two hours earlier, he was in prison. Getting a shave and cleaned up. Now he's riding around in the Pharaoh's chariot. And all of Egypt is bowing their knee to him. Because he is in charge of them. He is the authority over them. And he's only got this authority because of what the Pharaoh has said. When the Pharaoh said, you are second only to me. All of a sudden he went from prisoner to second only under Pharaoh. Only God can do that. Amen. Only God can do that. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. He's just like, if you don't understand this, let me tell you how powerful you are. Even though I'm Pharaoh, without your command, no one can move, do anything. That's how powerful you are. I'm releasing this kind of power. I think God speaks that kind of stuff to us. He wants us to believe who we are in Christ. Instead of walking around with this belief that we're paupers and slaves and nothing but a sinner. Yeah. He wants us to agree with what he's done in us. He wants us to agree that we're new creations, that we've been born again, that we have the mind of Christ, the spirit of God. He sealed us. We're children of the king. He, he speaks these things over us and he wants us to believe what he's saying. He wants us to believe that whatever you ask for in prayer, you believe it, I'll do it. Whatever you ask according to my will, I hear it and I will do it. That's how precious your word is. That's how powerful you are. That's why he says that repeatedly. Because he's elevated us out of slavery and he's made us princes and princesses, children of the king with great power and great authority. And just like Joseph, we, we need to walk in what God has just spoken over us. 
what he has declared over us in scripture, we need to agree with him and say, well, I'm not going to go back to the prison cell. I'm going to walk in, even if it's scary, even if I've never done it before, I'm going to walk in what God has spoken over me. Now, the things that God, that Pharaoh is speaking, God is the one who is moving him to do this. God is the one who's elevating Joseph. Pharaoh is the physical earthly vessel, the puppet doing it. But we all know who's elevating Joseph. <laughs> it's God who's elevating Joseph. Pharaoh only has his position because God gave it to him. That's very clear in the scriptures. All right. I knew it would get me. All right. Um, and Pharaoh, he changes his name, Joseph's name. He says, then Pharaoh named Joseph Zephanath Paneah, and he gave him As Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, as his wife. And Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. Let me read 46 to 49. There's a good stopping spot. That's where we're going to end. Now, Joseph was 30 years old. Can you believe that? When he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Pharaoh went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in a great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. Wow. By the time he's 30, we got 30 years olds who won't move out of their parents' basement and stop playing video games. And he is second under Pharaoh at 30. What happens to us when we give our lives to Christ and we follow God in faith? Amazing thing.